Uh, move on to the 10 minute rule motion. Bob Seeley. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much indeed, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, uh, I, move, I beg to move uh, that Lee be given to bring in a bill to make provision for the annual approval by the House of Commons of maximum numbers in respect of immigration and asylum, to provide that asylum may be granted to individuals identified as refugees by the UN Refugee Council, other than in specified circumstances and for connected purposes. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm delighted to be bringing in this bill. The British people want Parliament and their representatives to get to grips with immigration, both illegal and legal. It is a widespread conviction held by constituents across parties and across regions. According to YouGov, 64% of voters think that immigration has been too high over the last 10 years. Only 6% believe it has been too low. On the island, according to my most recent survey of 2,000 constituents, it is the second most important issue after the NHS. This bill, my bill, helps reinforce parliamentary sovereignty, encourages transparency in decision-making, focuses responsibility on members of parliament, and in doing so helps restore faith in government and in parliament. Now, we have made a considerable success of immigration in the past 50 years in the post-war war period, and there is an accepted case that moderate migration is a good thing for our country. Now, I'm hugely proud to be English and British, but in fact, I'm half immigrant myself. I don't necessarily think of myself often in those terms. But my ancestors and my mum, my mum after World War II ended up in Dresden in a displaced persons camp. Uh, for two centuries, her ancestors came from the Russian Empire. They were a mix of German, and if I understand Polish and Ukrainian ancestry, they farmed near Zhytomyr, 60 miles uh, west of Kiev. The other half of me is solidly English. But wherever you come from, there is a shared sense that migration should be moderate and should be controlled. Now, this government is doing more than any other in recent years. We hear today that the removals are up 25% of illegal uh, people. The Rwanda scheme is due to start later this year, whatever you think of it. We have growing numbers of return agreements with other nations. But I think we need something more permanent, because all this requires political will. And I think, for me, the only way that ultimately we will solve this issue and that we will give our voters and our constituents a confidence in this issue is for Parliament to take responsibility on itself to set annual legal limits for legal migration, including for asylum. The only way MPs will be serious about this issue is if we have to look our constituents in the eye and explain our actions. There will be no hiding between, behind quangos or behind agencies. My plan, my bill, would require the government to present a figure or range of figures to Parliament. MPs will have the access to the same data. We and the British people could see what each figure would deliver in terms of costs, in terms of benefits, what would the effect be on housing, on public services, on the economy, on social cohesion. It is extraordinary that this debate thus far has been happening without reference to many other of these important issues, that somehow immigration can be debated without talking about housing, without talking about education, without talking about health care provision. Either way, at the end of the day, MPs will own the figure and they will have to explain it to their constituents. It is called democracy, and in my mind, it is a good thing. If there are emergencies, such as Hong Kong or Ukraine, ministers can come back and ask for a waiver for specific numbers, in line with our international obligations. The critical point here, Madam Deputy Speaker, is I'm not stipulating a figure. I'm not sort of plucking one out of thin air. It is the principle of parliamentary sovereignty which I would have thought we should all, as parliamentarians, want to support. In theory, the Labour Party could say that we want a million plus a year migration. The Lib Dems, they're meant to be here to oppose, but they're so concerned to be here, I can't see a single one of them who is meant to be speaking in opposition. The Lib Dems or the SNP, who are here in force, could, could suggest too many. In theory, Parliament could decide what it wants, but it is about giving power back to Parliament. And for me, Madam Deputy Speaker, this this debate and this plan touches on wider issues that are parliamentarians passing their powers, their responsibilities to others. In scandal after scandal, we see experts failing and politicians having to effectively cover for them, whether it's the post office scandal, 
or whether it is the blood, the contaminated blood scandal. The answer is not less power to Parliament, it is not more quangos, it is not more experts, it is actually more debate, more scrutiny, more transparency, transparency so that people can see what is happening in their name and they can test and judge the people who make those decisions. Now, granted, in a, if there is a Conservative government, the practical outcome of that bill, of my bill, will be to lower legal migration from its current levels to something, dare I say, it, in line with our manifesto commitments. <laughs> yeah. But it is also about greater thought as to what our nation wants and needs. Our honourable friends from Market Harbour and Newark, in their excellent Centre for Policy Studies report, demolished many of the lazy arguments about migration that is automatically associated with economic growth. Arguably, the era of mass migration has seen slower economic growth per capita. We know that uh, mass migration exacerbates pressure on social housing and housing and health standards and health services. Our build rate, by historic standards, is actually pretty healthy at the moment, but it is dwarfed because of the high net migration. So my bill will force us to think, do we really need to grant visas for jobs that British people could do with a bit of encouragement or higher wages? One of the great ironies of this debate is that people who want large girl immigration are doing so at the price of suppressing wages of some of the poorest people in this country. And you would have thought the SNP and the Lib Dems and the Labour Party, who profess to, work, to care for the working people, would consider some of these arguments. So rather than hoovering up com computer programmers and doctors and dentists and care workers from other countries, why don't we train up some more ourselves? Uh, my bill also would make civil servants maybe think more carefully about getting their numbers correct. The uh, health, uh, Department for Health forecasts 6,000 people would use the health and social care visa route. In fact, 146,000 people did last year with 203,000 dependents. That is a population one and a half times the size of Portsmouth. We need to think about the impact of these decisions we are making where the civil servants are getting the numbers so phenomenally, dramatically wrong. Uh, I'd also like to, to touch briefly on asylum as well. We've granted asylum to nearly half a million people since 2015. An, an, again, extraordinary number. Uh, there are nine safe and legal routes into this country. There were ten at the time, because that included Syria. But to prevent a full a pull factor and to ensure that people have confidence that refugees are refugees, I would argue, or I would like this bill, to have all refugees coming via UN programmes. Now, I don't think the UNHCR, the UN High Commission of Refugees, behave particularly well over the Rwanda ruling. But it is still the only global body that looks after refugees. And my plan would see our country only take refugees that come via bona fide UN, uh, uh, UN approved refugees from genuine war torn areas. This would strengthen, again, people's confidence in the system. It will also give the added benefit of cutting back on our own asylum system, which, sad to say, is increasingly unfit for purpose. What sane system gives 50% of people from Albania asylum? when they come from a safe European country. It is simply not credible. So my bill enhances democracy, enhances accountability, enhances transparency, certainly its intention. Those opposing the bill, respectfully, I say, say this to them, but I'm grateful they've, the SNP have turned up. I wish the Liberals had, because apparently they were speaking against this. They're opposing parliamentary scrutiny, they're opposing powers being handed back to members of parliament. They're opposing transparency, and they are setting themselves against the will of the people of Scotland and the people of Britain. We need more transparency, Madam Deputy Speaker, in our national decision making. We need to question civil servants and experts more, not less. We need greater scrutiny and a greater role for parliament to allow MPs and the public that level of scrutiny that enables good government. That is the purpose of this bill. It is to give Parliament power to set migration numbers. The British people want a fair but robust, um, robust immigration system. They are right. My new law will deliver that and make sure that we, members of Parliament, are answerable to our people. Thank you. Yeah, yeah.
The question is that the honourable member have leave to bring in the bill. Uh, Alison Thoulis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Well, I stand on behalf of the SNP, um, not, not from the Lib Dems. They have clearly uh, chickened out and run away. Um, <laughs> not for the first time. Uh, on this issue. Now, I am very proud to say that I support immigration. Immigration is an yeah, economic yeah. Sorry, good. We thank people uh, for coming here, for contributing, uh, for bringing uh, their, their best talents and skills to this country. They contribute so very much. And it is an act of uh, absolutely bizarre economic damage to try and restrict those numbers in the way that the Honourable Gentleman has set out uh, in his 10-minute rule bill. Um, the issue that we have had in Scotland for many years has been emigration, not immigration. Immigration yeah. is, in, is an essential part of a thriving economy. Scotland would, uh, is, is set to experience considerable population decline in the absence of net international migration. And that will have a significant impact on our economy because the people that come here um, to work, they contribute, they pay the pensions of our older people, yeah, they look yeah, after yeah. people, they contribute uh, and they bring their skills uh, to our economy. They are welcome and we should not tell them otherwise. Uh, the Honourable Member, by seeking to put a cap on the number of people coming, it really should, this bill really should be entitled uh, the cutting off our nose to spite our face bill, yeah. because a cap on numbers is entirely illogical and it is impractical. If he was to say 1,000 people, he would shut the door on the 1,000 plus one, regardless of what talent and skills they may bring or what uh, economic benefits or otherwise they may generate. It is absolutely illogical. And he mentioned uh, that people uh, bring him concerns about migration. Well, the evidence is that people consistently get migration numbers wrong. It is our job as MPs to inform people, not to pander to some of the worst prejudices. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it is also the case that pe people in the areas that see the lowest migration t seem to bizarrely uh, have the most fear of migration, whereas those people who are fortunate enough to, to live in constituencies like Glasgow Central welcome migration because they see the benefits of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it is absolutely uh, bizarre. And Migration Policy Scotland have work on this that just came out uh, in recent days. And they say that in Scotland, people's views on migration remain more positive than negative. Uh, and it isn't, he does not speak for us when he talks Absolutely. about the will of the people of Scotland. No, no, no. He does not and cannot speak for the people of Scotland who thank uh, those that come to, uh, to work and to contribute uh, in whichever ways that they do. He talked also about pressure on health services. Well, the, the reality, again, of this is you're more likely to be treated by a migrant to be in the yeah. queue next to one. Yeah. People are coming here to work in our health and social care sector, and we thank them for it. We need them desperately as a sector that sees significant shortages. <laughs> and again, it is not the, it is not the, uh, the case that um, people migrating to this country suppress wage growth. In fact, countries that have higher immigration than we do have higher wage growth than the pathetic, insipid wage growth that broke Brexit Britain has had. Uh, so he again is wrong on that issue. We have significant labour shortages in the UK as a result of their ridiculous Brexit policies. The ONS have said that a third of UK businesses are experiencing labour shortages. A third of businesses experiencing labour shortages with, a, 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 with an impact on productivity. In sectors such as hospitality, in farming, in health and social care, in professional services, in scientific and technical services, all of these people are crying out for skills, skills that we do not have. Now, if he wants to come here with an argument for in investing uh, further in education than the Tories, which have cut back over many years, or further in universities than the Tories have cut back in many years, I'd be interested in that argument. But that's not what he's saying. No, he says, turn off the tap and everything will be fine. It could not be further from the truth. And I move to the point around the graduate visa and international students. Now, as the constituency uh, in the UK that benefits the very most from international students in Glasgow Central, I see that very, very clearly, that international students bring a significant benefit. And there's been much chat about the graduate visa, which the MAC, despite the fact that they didn't uh, approve of it coming in in the first place, have said that the UK government should keep. And Apart from any other policy that the UK government has, this policy has actually been a successful one. It's actually met its targets. It's exceeded its targets. It has been a roaring success. 
So, of course, perversely, there are members in the Tory benches that want to scrap it. You couldn't make this up. Um, and the changes that they have already made uh, by removing uh, dependents from visas has already knocked half a percentage off of GDP. If they want to continue down this road, they will see further economic damage from this, and they will see significant damage to our educational institutions as well, because the model that has been created over many years has built in the fact that these institutions require international students to do this. But it has a benefit also. It benefits very much those students in those classes who can sit next to international students, who can learn from them, who can grow from them, and they bring so much uh, by way of their experience as well as helping financially. We are already in the UK 300,000 workers short as a result of their damaging Brexit policies. That, is not being, that shortfall is not being made up because of the poor decisions this government are making, uh, pursuing the end of free movement, as the Labour Party also believe in. They are damaging uh, Scotland's economy, Scotland who did not vote for Brexit um, because of their uh, ideological obsession. And when the, when the UK when the, the member opposite also talks about uh, the role of UNHCR, I'm not quite sure if he's actually spoken to UNHCR because that's not their job. That is not what they do. Their, their role is not to determine who's a refugee and who isn't. Now, in very limited circumstances, the UNHCR operates a resettlement policy, but the UNHCR say themselves resettlement is the rare exception. It's available to less than less than 1% of refugees worldwide. A very small number uh, uh, arrived in the UK through resettlement programmes. <coughs> that is why we have an asylum system in the country just now. It's very poorly run, I would say that, of the Home Office, and he wants again to make an argument about reforming the Home Office and uh, their terrible policies. I would support him in that, but that's not what he's saying. He seems to be su suggesting that perhaps the Home Office's immigration policy uh, uh, areas should be removed altogether and handed over to an international organisation to determine, which again, I don't think is quite what he means, but that is what he is saying. The UNHCR have a very important role. They carry out international functions. They have also criticised uh, very uh, damningly the UK government's uh, immigration policies, the Rwanda plans and other things. But he's asking UNHCR to do a job that is not their job. And I think that just points to the ludicrousness and the unenforceability of the bill that he brings here today. It is simply not practical. Um, Madam Deputy Speaker, this bill speaks to a, a very small um, and narrow group of people within the Conservative Party and within the rest of the UK. People who want to close the doors and draw the, pull up the drawbridge and not, nobody in to little Brexit Britain. He does not speak for Scotland. Scotland wants to be part of the world to decide these policies for ourselves. Yes, to have a migration policy that decides who comes in and who doesn't, but not to shut the door. Not to pretend that somehow, by doing so, that Britain will be some uh, special little land that it once was. Britain has always welcomed people from around the world and has a legacy of going also out into the world and empire and everything else. We have those links. We, are, we want to be that international country as Scotland. Britain is holding us back. It's preventing us from allowing people into our country to have the migration policy that we need. I have supported the devolution of migration policy, but I cannot wait for the day that we get full control over all of the policies so that Scotland's economy and Scotland's future uh, can be in Scotland's hands rather than a, a Westminster government that does not see uh, our needs, that does not recognise what we as a country want and does not speak for us either at home or on the international stage. Yeah. Yeah. The question is that the Honourable Member have leave to bring in the bill. As many as are of that opinion say aye. 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 Of the contrary, no. <laughs> Division, clear the lobby. The question is that the Honourable Member have leave to bring in the bill. As many as are of that opinion say aye. 
contrary, no. No. Tell us for the eyes, Kelly Tolhurst and Dr. Caroline Johnson. Tell us for the nose, Peter Grant and Gavin Newland. Mm -hmm.
Order. The eyes to the right, 74. The nose to the left, 49. <coughs> the eyes to the right, 74. The nose to the left, 49. So the eyes have it, the eyes have it unlocked. Where is he? Who prepare and bring in the bill? Uh, Robert Jenrick, Danny Kruger, Marco Longhi, Leah Nietzsche, Nick Fletcher, Dr Caroline Johnson, Sir Edward Lee, Henry Smith and myself, Madam Deputy Speaker. Bob Seeley. Immigration Asylum Bill. Second reading, what day? Friday the 14th of June. Friday the 14th of June. Thank you.